At the end of our last class, we were talking about the psychodynamics of phobias. And I just want to, to give you uh, a very brief overview of, of how that's such a good model for trying to understand what is the difference between like manifest content and latent content or the, or the meaning of a symptom. And you notice I've, I keep stressing the fact that in, in Freud, and you'll see this also in Jung, metaphor is terribly important. Now, in, uh, to give you an example, I was thinking about a, a, a phobic a patient that I once saw. The person was referred because she was phobic for flying, uh, a common phobia. Many people are phobic for flying. But what was very unusual in this case is that this woman was an extremely successful uh, international consultant. So uh, she had to fly. And when she came in, and, and she was referred by her physician, and we began talking, I found that, that she had flown hundreds of thousands of miles. And, uh, and actually had not had any symptoms of being phobic until uh, about the last 10 months. And I began, you know, going through talking with her about her history and I learned uh, some unusual things. For instance, I learned this woman actually was a licensed pilot. And, and she logged all these hours. And she had always enjoyed flying. And now all of a sudden, she is phobic for flying. She experiences tremendous anxiety when she is about to go on a plane. Now, now, she would force herself to go on the plane, but it would be with, with just real terror. So in the course of, of gathering her history, one of the elements that comes up is that her mother had died at age 48 of a heart attack. And when I asked this woman about uh, her age, she had just turned, 10 months ago, she had turned 47. And so she was anticipating in another couple of months, she will be 48. And we began to talk about what her experience had been like. Uh, she had been born late, so her, her mother died when she was fairly young. And it was a tremendous loss to her. I mean, she never really resolved the fact that her mother had died. And now she had kind of magically come up with this sense that she too will have a heart attack at age 48. And part of the dynamics in this is that her mother had a heart attack and uh, when she was alone and the physicians eventually said the mother probably could have been saved except they just didn't get to her in time. So we have our patient now who unconsciously believes that she is going to follow in her mother's steps, that she too will have a heart attack sometime around the time she's 48. And her fear is it will happen when she's on an airplane. That is, they will not be able to get to her. They will not be able to take care of her. So here you have a situation in which the presenting problem, namely the fear of flying, has absolutely nothing to do with the fear. It isn't a fear of flying. It is a fear that I am going to have a heart attack, that is I'm going to become helpless, and I'm going to be in a situation in which I cannot be taken care of. And there were all kinds of things in her life that were conflictual about being taken care of. Well, once we began to really talk about this, and once we began to, to deal with all of the fears that she has, and of course, this woman, by the way, you know, has seen a physician who has told her she has no heart problems. I mean, the physician uh, has told me, I am not at all concerned that this person uh, is at high risk for any kind of heart attack. Uh, but once we began talking through this, and she began talking about the tremendous pain in losing her mother, and how she had always longed for this person to be able to be with her longer, and also some of her fantasies about how, had she been home when her mother had this heart attack, she could have done something for her. So she felt guilty about not being home, although it was an irrational guilt. She should have been at school as she was at the time. But 
the, the point, uh, you know, in talking about this is that very frequently the anxiety around a phobia really is unconscious. That is, the, the conscious element, I am afraid of flying, is pretty irrelevant because that is not what is the source of anxiety. But as Freud posited, what we do is we develop safe fears. It was, it was too painful and too difficult for this woman to just talk about spontaneously uh, the loss of her mother and the fear she had that she would follow in an identical path. It took, you know, being in therapy, being taught how to feel safe, uh, coming to the point where she felt comfortable enough to start disclosing a lot of very primitive fears that all of this came out. Once all of this came out, by the way, and she really began to understand this, then the whole issue of fear of flying went away. And so she didn't have that problem anymore. And, and that, you know, is, is really, uh, you know, very important that one understand that kind of thing. Now, there's another uh, element I wanted to mention, too, that we had just finished up on dreams. But it, it, one thing about dreams that uh, was mentioned by someone here is that often dreams are very recent events. So if you're wondering, you know, if you dream uh, uh, about recent events, is that common? Yeah, that's very common. Uh, and that's one of the ways sometimes that we mask what we're, we're really searching for, or what we're really struggling with. Uh, to give you an example, supposing uh, you, a person went out to a party last night. They come home. They have a dream about going to a party. And the dream is that I forgot to take my ballpoint pen to the party. And as a result, I felt when I got there, I wanted to get somebody's, this is the dream now, when I got there, I wanted to get somebody's number and I didn't have a pen, so I couldn't do it. I couldn't get the number. Now, Often in a dream like that, when you get a person to associate, what you find out is that, first of all, not bringing the pen means I felt unprepared. Uh, when a person goes further, actually what they end up saying is, I really felt inadequate to be at this party. Uh, it may be, but not necessarily so, that the pen also <clears throat> is, is very much a sexual object, and it means I, I felt sexually inadequate for uh, interacting with some of the people that I saw at this party. Uh, if the person associates far enough, sometimes they will talk about the fact that when I go in any social interaction, I feel inadequate. I feel unprepared. I feel I don't have what is necessary in order to really be involved with other mature adults. I always feel like there's something I forgot, there's something I lack, there's something I don't have. Now, that, that's the wonderful part about the metaphor. The metaphor is pretty easy. Gee, you forgot your pen. No big deal. Uh, but the dream uh, suggests to you, you were very anxious about forgetting your pen. Well, why would one be so anxious about forgetting their pen? It, it doesn't really make sense. Therefore, you can just put it aside and forget about it. In therapy, what you do is you focus very actively on this and you keep pursuing associations to find out where will that take you. And that becomes the, the, the very, very important uh, mechanism when a person can't find any other way to tell the therapist about their anxieties, to simply associate to dreams. Now, the, the one other dynamic that I wanted to mention to you that, or symptom that, that Freud did talk about, and of course it's, it's one that we all have experienced, and that is its depression. Now, in our modern times, uh, we have run to, to drugs as the way to solve everything. And many people today are trying to posit that depression really is a biological issue. Uh, the truth is, the evidence shows that there are some forms of depression that probably have a biological base and probably can, <clears throat> can best be treated uh, biologically uh, with drugs. But to jump to the conclusion 
that all forms of depression uh, really have some kind of biological root or should be looked upon that way uh, runs counter to all of our experiences. Now Freud was on the other end though. Freud felt that depression is a symptom of a psychological problem. And his thesis was that you get depressed because you cannot deal with your anger, with your rage. And not being able to deal with your rage, like that is, you are feeling a lot of rage unconsciously, but not being able to deal with it, but being very frightened that it's going to come out, you get depressed, meaning you get inactive. You don't do anything because there's this profound fear that if you do something, what will pour out of you is a, a lot of angry impulses. Now, this thesis still, ha you know, is unquestionably correct in some cases. Uh, there, there are events, of course, where you get depressed, and it's in response to a really existential event. Uh, you experience some very important loss in your life. Uh, probably, you know, the easiest example in many ways is <clears throat> if you were, you're a young mother and you have a little child and you take the child off to the park, the child is doing well, you're doing well, I mean, life is good. And the child runs out in front of a car and is hit. Well, all of a sudden, I mean, in, in one minute, one's life is dramatically changed. Let's say the child, even it was tragic, let's say the child died. All of a sudden, a mother who is very nurturing and caring and loving her child is full of guilt that uh, she should have done something for her child. Of course, now she feels very helpless. If this woman <clears throat> gets very depressed, it is not because she has some kind of biological uh, predeterminant that says that she will get depressed. <clears throat> She's getting depressed because there's a very ex existential event over which she has no control. And there's nothing she can do about it, but she feels incredibly bad that she should have done something. So that's one way in which depression comes, and those depressions can be dealt with, painful as they are. Now the other one, the, the kind that Freud talked about more, let's say would be a, a woman who becomes involved uh, with a man and, and really cares about him. And let's say she makes a lot of sacrifices for the relationship. Let's say the guy job gets moved to another city, she gives up her job and she goes off to the other city. Big sacrifice for her, she liked her job. She gets to the other city and soon after she finds out that this man is having an affair with someone else. And she is devastated uh, and she finds out that he's going to leave her. Now here she is, she has first of all given up a very important part of herself, that is her previous job. Secondly she has come to be with this man, only to find out that she doesn't have the job she once had where she was very productive, but she has been rejected by someone uh, who is very important to her. Now let's say in the history of, of this uh, woman that this is the third time that she has gotten herself into a relationship where she has made a bad choice and, and she has ended up being the person who was rejected never saw it coming. And she, you know, being bright, but being very dependent, let's say, is rageful with herself. She is so angry with herself. She's incredibly disappointed with herself. Uh, and she begins to feel that, you know, this will never change. Now, one possible scenario is that rather than allow herself to be as enraged as she should be with this guy, and perhaps even allowing herself to be enraged with herself because she has been so foolish in her choices, she kind of gives up and she becomes depressed. And, and the depression is really her way of refusing to deal with all the rage that's in her, with all the disappointment that's in her. So if you see her and you see her uh, being very depressed and you ask her why she's very depressed, sometimes people like this will say, I, I don't know. You know well, in fact, if, if she makes her 
way to someone who uh, refers her for therapy, uh, you know, and she comes in for therapy, you look at her, you know she's depressed. But if you ask her, you know, like, why are you depressed? In the beginning, often the person will say, I don't know. You know, I'm kind of new in town and I haven't gotten a job yet and I'm, you know, trying to make an adjustment. And only after you would probe for a while would you actually find out that indeed something very traumatic has happened. And it's not the first time. And it's very painful. And of course, when the person finally talks about this, and, and it's not just talking about it, it's really getting in touch with the fact that she is very angry about this. And once the anger comes out, then you find the person is no longer depressed. Now, with people who are depressed, there are also a couple of other uh, insights that come out of psychodynamic theory. One of them is <clears throat> depression is a fairly uh, primitive symptom. That is, it is an important symptom. It is kind of a last resort for some people. So when you see someone who is depressed, the first thing you do is not to try to make them not depressed. The first thing you do is to try to find out why is the person depressed. And in some cases, you know, it is important you allow someone to be depressed because they're not ready to deal with all of that feeling that I just mentioned. And one of the sad things that happens with, with inexperienced therapists is sometimes people, or even friends, people rush in to try to help that person overcome that symptom. And if the person is not ready to give up the symptom, but they, they kind of push to do so, uh, then they go on to the next step. And if you think about in depression and you're profoundly depressed and you can't remain profoundly depressed, what is the next step? Suicide, right. And, and, and there are lots of cases, by the way, like this, where a person, it's why, for instance, you don't medicate someone right away because they're depressed uh, until you get some idea why are they depressed. You don't want to alleviate that feeling, difficult as it is, without knowing what is it that it's masking. But once you know what it's masking, then it may be appropriate to medicate the person, or it may be appropriate to simply engage them in psychotherapy. But one wants to be very careful. Now, now the powerful thing that Freud taught was to teach us that what you see in so many symptoms is not what is really there. That's why the whole idea of metaphor is so important. What the symptom tells you is there is a problem, but the actual concrete thing you are seeing often is not what the issue is. And so you want to probe, you want to find out, and, and once you really find out, like, what is wrong here, then you're in a position uh, to change things. All right, now, we're going to leave Freud to move on to a student of his. And the student of his is Carl Jung. And the the personality theory proposed by Jung really came from his work with Freud, as well as, another, as, well as a number of influences in his life. And you know, if you recall in, in uh, the beginning of the course, uh, I started off telling you some things about myself. And I wonder, were, were any of you curious about why is he telling us these things about himself? Any of you ask yourself that? Have you had any thoughts since about why would I tell you anything about my own background, my own early life? Why would that have any meaning in this course? Anybody have any ideas? Sure. To help us analyze you as we go along, to be able That you could analyze me as you, as you go along? That's certainly likely to happen. <laughs> and that may be one of the reasons. What else might be a reason? Sure. Because your uh, back personal history can tell a lot about your uh, present behavior. <laughs> because my background will tell a lot about my behavior. Very good. That's. What else? Sure. Makes it more interesting. Okay. Makes it more interesting. Perhaps you actually have a real person who's like right. me. <laughs> okay. What else? Sure. 
think also to let us uh, relate our own personal experiences uh, to what is relevant to this cause of personality. Very good. Uh, what she's saying is that this enables you to consider relating your own personal experiences to the material that's in this course. And certainly I hope you will do that. Now there's still another reason. If you've been reading the book, what happens, and, and I hope you are reading the book, what happens at the beginning of almost every chapter? They give a synopsis of the, of the psychiatrist's life. Give the synopsis of the person's life, yes. Why do you think Dr. Allen is doing that? Sure. So you can relate the theory that they propose to possibly, you know, connect, connect their life to the, to the theory that, that they um, Well, that's one possibility. What else might be active here? You're all very close. I mean, the... Sure. Understand how they might have developed their theory? Yes. Yes, it's very important to realize we're all biased. And it's helpful to know, like, what happened in someone's life? What happened in your life? What's happened in my life? What happened in these different theorists' lives? And you'll see that as we move through the course, that there are, are sometimes very important events in a person's life that actually shape the way they see things. And you're going to see that, certainly, uh, as we talk about Jung today. And what you're actually going to see it in, in all of the theorists. Uh, you'll see it later on uh, if you read existential theorists. You know, some of the existential theorists uh, actually were Jews who were uh, in victims of the Holocaust, either because they lost loved ones. Some of them were actually in camps. I mean, you, so you have these very profound existential experiences. So it's not surprised that existential theory appealed to them. And they began uh, you know, to see life through traumatic events, because you look at their life as full of trauma. Uh, there are other people who had early life losses, and so early life events, uh, that is, that is losses in early life become very important to them. So it's good, you know, in that, uh, the beginning of each chapter when you read about the theorist to get a sense of like, you know, who was this person who developed this personality theory? Uh, and and that, that can be very helpful to you. Now, Freud, uh, excuse me, Freud Jung, uh, you know, acknowledged that he had a weak father, as he felt his father was weak. And his father was a classical and oriental scholar. And Jung talked about the fact that he had an inconsistent mother who, on one hand, he perceived as being very strong, but at the same time, she suffered from a mental illness. And she was hospitalized for a significant period of time when Jung was about three. And, and he describes that this period of separation from his mother at age three was very painful to him. So he is someone very in tune with what it would be like to lose your mom or not to have the, the nurturing from your mom very early in life. Now, other important influences in his life were his maternal grandfather, excuse me, his paternal grandfather, uh, who was a physician, who was interested in mental health, in philosophy, in classical studies, and poetry. Jung was named after his paternal grandfather. His maternal grandparents were renowned Hebrew scholars. They were theologians of distinctions, of distinction, and they were interested in parapsychology, which you will see plays a very significant role in, in Jung's theory. So many of Jung's later interests uh, one of them, by the way, being creativity and old age, something people like Freud did not even touch. But Jung spent real time because he had these older people around him who were continuing, these scholars, his grandparents, who were continuing to be very creative later in life. So, so these interests came really from many of his early kinship identifications. 
It's also important uh, to recall, too, that you know, Jung very openly talked about his parents' bad marriage, about the, the real marital difficulties that they had, and that for him, <clears throat> it was very difficult to live in an environment where there was so much conflict. So many things came, uh, important, became important in Jung's uh, life and therefore became important in his theory that you can trace directly to what were his life experiences. Now, his theory, by the way, you know, really is a complex theory. Uh, and, and you'll find that there, there are a lot of issues that he brings up and lots of distinctions, so much so that when you, you read Jung, you know, you have a sense this theory really is obsessive. Uh, he makes an awful lot of distinctions. You have to, if you read his own work, you have to pay a lot of attention to what he's talking about. And, and so he struggled really with, uh, you know, really trying to attempt to present the complexity that he saw in personalities. And, and he posited many themes and constructs that, that were not only difficult to understand, but they were extremely difficult to operationally define and, and therefore to empirically test. So one of the problems that you'll see with Jung is it was very difficult and has continued to be difficult to do empirical research on his theory because you actually can't define these multitude of variables that he's telling you are important and therefore you can't get a group of people and test out whether or not these variables are operating on them or not. However, in spite of this, Jung has, has always been perceived as really a major thinker and a major developer of psychoanalytic theory. And, and one of his certainly contributions is that he focused on the intricacy of humankind and he tried to address personality, leaving it complex. And you'll see in later theorists not finding a way to deal with personality in the complexity that it really has. They had made it very simplistic in order to do research. Jung did the opposite. He left it very complex, but it interfered with his ability to do very organized research. Now, he was influenced also by at least four predecessors who are particularly important philosophers of the unconscious. Today, by the way, I have to, uh, ah, there we are. Okay. One is Gottfried Leibniz. Gottfried Leibniz postulated a concept of an irrational unconscious, and he did this in the 18th century. So he was one of the early people to start talking about the fact that in man, not only is there your conscious life, but there is this unconscious life that influences you. Then there was Carl Gustav Karras, who distinguished three levels of unconscious functioning, including a general universal one that had creative, compensatory, and self-healing functions. And you'll see uh, very shortly how this played into the theory that Jung developed. Then there was Arthur Schopenhauer, who also was in the 1880s. He emphasized irrational forces that work in man. And he actually said they were principally blind sexual forces that were often repressed. So Schopenhauer, obviously, is a real precursor to Freud, one of the first people to actually talk about the irrationality in a person and to say that this really is tied to sexual forces. Then the fourth influence is a man named Eduard von Hartmann, who described three levels of unconscious thinking. And Part of this included an absolute or universal source of images. And images become very important in this theory. Now, Jung himself was an introverted youngster who actually wished to be an archaeologist. But his family was poor, and the only university where he could go to study archaeology was too far away. So the family could not afford to send him there. So they sent him to the local university. In his case, it was the University of Basel. 
uh, in Switzerland. And he went to the university and eventually he became a psychiatrist. And he found the, the world of serious mental illness, especially schizophrenia, to be very interesting for him. And he felt that the complex delusions of psychotic people contained many of the myths and fantasies that one finds in primitive cultures. And this actually had been an interest of his for many years. And, and he, he had a lot of insights. He, he, he got very involved with schizophrenia. And many of our insights about schizophrenia, early insights at least, came from some of his work. Uh, one in which uh, you know, he describes uh, getting into the, to kind of the world of the schizophrenic and trying to understand like, why the person feels this way. And I remember, in fact, the very first schizophrenic patient that I ever had was a hospitalized person. And at one point, when he was not psychotic, he actually began describing what it's like to be hallucinating and to, uh, and to give in to hallucinations. And it, it was a really remarkable description. He, he started describing the fact that the last time he hallucinated, he was on an airplane. And he hears this voice. And the voice says, change seats. And he says, now I knew that that was a voice. I knew that there wasn't anybody there. But I looked at that open seat and I thought, well, I'll see what happens. So he changes seats. Then the voice tells him, change seats again, moving up toward the front. Then the voice says, change seats again. He said, well, now this is, this is becoming interesting. I, he, uh, he said, I, I still had some control. And, uh, but I changed seats again. Then the voice got louder, more demanding, and now I just felt I'm going to do what it says. So the voice says, open the door. And here he is on a plane. The plane's up in the air, by the way. And he starts to open the door of the plane. Well, luckily, there's an attendant there who grabs him, and they wrestle him down, and they uh, tie him up. And of course, when the plane lands, they put him in a psychiatric hospital. And that's where I got to see him. And, and what he described was, that in, in, the, in this schizophrenic world, in this world of hallucinations, in the beginning, it's fun. In the beginning, you even have some awareness that this is psychotic. But after you go to a certain point, you lose that freedom, or you feel you've lost that freedom, and then you just follow the voices. And, uh, and also, it's pleasant to follow the voices. Now. There are also, uh, you know, Jung recognized that not only do schizophrenic people like hear voices, but they have delusions. Now, delusions are fascinating uh, because often they are so utterly irrational. And the, to the inexperienced, when someone is delusional, people often try to convince the person that what they're saying is not true. Really common delusion, for example, is, uh, especially of hospitalized patients, the FBI is following me. The FBI is monitoring my mail. Uh, the FBI is, is checking on me all the time. Now, you see this often from uh, patients who are, are fairly uh, unsuccessful. Uh, often they're homeless, have no friends. Uh, and you say, why would somebody who is homeless, has no money, is not involved in any kind of activity that, that is meaningful, have this intense delusion that the FBI is following him. Why would you think someone would have that delusion? Sure. Make them okay. I know that it's a common phenomenon that occurs in hospital patients when they, they've been in a hospital for too long. Um, so I'm assuming it can occur from a feeling of loss of control or security. Okay. Th there's another reason. What were you going to say? I was going to say to make the cells feel important. Ah, yes. Here's somebody who has no importance. They have no money. Perhaps they're estranged from their family. Nothing is going on in their life. They put tremendous meaning in their life. The delusion makes them an important person. The federal government 
is checking on them. They've assigned agents to follow them. Uh, this person is, is very important. Now, what the naive do is they try to say to person, they get rational with them and say, now, do you really think that the FBI, with all of the things they have to do, are really following you? Worst thing you can say to a delusional person. What you're doing is you're saying, you are unimportant. You certainly are not important enough that the FBI would be checking on your mail. Well, that's the, the profound problem the person has, that the person feels that people would not pay attention. So what we learn in therapy is if you ever want to get anywhere with someone, you don't attack a delusion. You allow a person to have a delusion uh, as long as they need it. And by the way, the fascinating thing is if you attack a delusion, the person will just quit therapy. Uh, it is never an effective way to operate. And uh, in fact, there's, uh, there are many famous cases, by the way, of delusions, but I, one of them, uh, there's a book called The Three Christs of Ypsilanti. And it's about three patients who are in Ypsilanti, Michigan State Hospital, all of whom believe they're Jesus Christ, and, and how they interact with each other, and how they deal with, with this phenomena. And if, if you had the opportunity, I mean, and, and you really allowed yourself to see the dynamics, it, it is it's very striking how uh, truly psychotic people who are delusional and who need these delusions make adjustments if anybody attacks it. Uh, I remember, and, and I witnessed this myself, I was in a group one time, and it was a new patient, very psychotic group. One patient already in the group was Jesus Christ. The new patient introduces himself as Jesus Christ. So now we've got two patients in the group who are Jesus Christ. The first patient who's been in there longer says, you can't be Jesus Christ, I am Jesus Christ. The other patient, without missing a beat, looks at him and says, you're Jesus Christ. He says, you know, that must mean I'm the Blessed Mother. And went right on, had no trouble. And, and you say to yourself, well, what happened here? How is it that this person who is claiming to be Jesus Christ gives up that delusion? Well, if you think about it, he gave up the delusion in some ways to become even more powerful. Because by becoming the Blessed Mother, if you're familiar with, with Christian thought, the Blessed Mother was Jesus Christ's mother. So in some respects, she is an even more powerful figure than Jesus Christ in this situation. And the whole idea is to be a powerful person. So in our group uh, at that time, uh, and this was at a, many, many years ago when we didn't use drugs so much, we, we let people be uh, very symptomatic till we learn more about them. They, these people went on talking and they had no trouble in their roles, but you had to allow uh, that these were the people they were, even though you know, in, a, in a rational world, you could not possibly look at this guy and treat him as if he was the Blessed Mother. If, if you want to keep him in the group and you want to learn more about why is he so bizarre and what are all the dynamics in his life that cause him to behave like this, you have to do that. Now, another phenomena that, uh, that comes out of, uh, with schizophrenics and, and is important, this, this whole God thing I was telling you about, it, it's very common for schizophrenics to uh, feeling so insecure to relate to God and to try to create the sense that they have a special relationship with God. So in, in, in psychiatric hospitals, for example, having a patient say things like, if you do not let me out of this hospital, Today, at noon tomorrow, God will burn this place to the ground. Very, very common. Sometimes two or three people are, are, are telling you this. Uh, and it's not that the person even really wants to get out of the hospital so much, but they do want more attention. They do want things to be focused on them, and they want to be treated as very special. Uh, and, and you need to know that. Uh, and you, you always have to be very careful to not attack whatever people are saying, but rather to give them, and, and, and the more bizarre it is, probably the more primitive the person is, that means the more desperate they need uh, to have this kind of role. Well, this kind of thing fascinated Jung. He really liked uh, you know, working with people like this. 
And he disagreed with Freud uh, on, on a number of points, but, but two are especially important. First of all, Jung did not accept uh, the libido, that the libido concept, or the, that libido itself, consists only of sexual energy. And also, he, Jung did not build a closed personality system. Now, Freud did. In, in the sense that you notice how with Freud I have been pointing out to you that all behaviors seem to become pathological in some way. That is, Freud's system is a closed system in that you only have a choice of, of what is your pathology like. Uh, a good example might be in, in Freud's theory, if you are consistently early for an event, it's because you're anxious. If you are consistently late, it's because you're hostile. And if you're consistently on time, it's because you're compulsive. Now those are the only three options. So if you're going, if your characteristic behavior is one of those three, and after all, if you're going places, that you're likely either to be early, late, or on time. But in, in Freud's system, all of those could be seen as being motivated pathologically. Jung did not buy that. Jung said no. You know, some of those behaviors might exist, but there also is a way to function in a healthy way. That, that, that being mature and being healthy is possible, and that's something that you should aspire to. Jung believed that people were not only driven by id impulses and their past, but he also said that one could be teleologically oriented. That is, one could be motivated on aspirations in the future. And that's something that we have not talked about when we talked about Freud. I mean, the future wasn't very relevant. We always talked about the past. But Jung uh, said, no, the, the future is a motivating force. And, and many subsequent theorists, by the way, will pick up on this. Now, for Jung, the title for total personality was the psyche. So, Personality equals psyche. Psyche is kind of the overarching term for him. And, and in this sense, uh, Jung was, was more philosophical uh, than Freud. He posited that libido was a biological force. Excuse me, Freud had posited that libido was a biological force. Well, Jung taught about psychic energy being an explanation for libido and for other forces in life that he did not specifically identify as having a biological basis. Rather, he preferred to think about them simply as forces. And within this context, Jung frequently talked in terms of opposites. And he believed that conflict between many opposing forces actually produced the energy that developed personality. Now this conflict was very important to him in that it generated forces that caused people to act. He even posited that the psyche operates under the principle of opposites. Now, and you'll see uh, quickly as we, we study uh, Jung that, see he thought if you take opposites, good and bad, introversion, extroversion, that these kind of opposites drive people and, and people are always somewhere between these two poles. Uh, and, and he would posit, of course, that people are more toward one pole than the other, but they're often drawn to the opposite pole. And that tension he equated with forces, but he didn't give this uh, in any way uh, a biological root. Now, Jung believed that libido also operated according to the principles of equivalence and entropy. The principle of, equi of equivalence simply stated that there was a, a limited amount of psychic energy. And if a significant amount of psychic energy was used on one task, it meant there was less available for another. Now, that sounds very Freudian, doesn't it? 
That was certainly Freud's thesis, wasn't it? That if you uh, keep on using psychic energy in one of the earlier stages, you have less psychic energy left for later stages. And Jung's theory, uh, you know, posited the same thing in the sense that if you are using a certain amount of psychic energy on some conflict, that takes away from the psychic energy that's available for other parts of your life. Now, so for him, if you invested a great deal of energy in studies, uh, then you would have less energy left uh, to invest in your social life. And, uh, and what's interesting is he used that example, and that's actually a fairly good description of Jung himself. That is, as, as a young man, uh, he invested a lot of energy in his studies, and he wasn't particularly a social person. The principle of entropy explains a process within the psyche whereby elements of unequal strength seek psychological equilibrium. That's that point where I was saying, you know, you're on one side of, the, of this opposite, you move towards the, un, towards the other. And Jung believed that any extreme will eventually be offset by its opposite expression. Thus he held that, for example, that the introverted person actually has a drive to be more outgoing. And that eventually, that desire to be outgoing will find expression in some way so that the introverted person will not always remain just introverted. Now, for Jung, the ego was a more complex uh, concept than it had been for Freud. He saw it as a unifying force and primarily, but not wholly, conscious. So, in that sense, he's, he's close to Freud in that both of them saw the ego as mostly conscious. Also, uh, Jung posited that the ego was part of the psyche, but it wasn't all of it. And, and that's very important because, as you know, uh, the, the, he's already posited the psyche is all of your personality. Uh, we've always said the ego is part of your personality, uh, and he's saying that it's a very important part, more, impart, more important than what uh, the, the, than the importance Freud gave to it, but not so important that it would be everything. Okay, we're going to take a break now, and then we'll return to continue talking about this theory.